In this video, I am going to be talking about calculating statistical power for a test. First, here is the example we are going to be working with. A small chain of coffee shops are thinking about expanding their menu offering to include giant chocolate chip cookies, and want to know if tempting their customers with chocolate will increase or decrease the average amount of money their customers spend in a visit. To test this, they begin offering chocolate chip cookies at one of their coffee shops and track purchases by sampling three random purchases every hour for a day. Before the introduction of cookies, the average purchase total was $4.20, with a standard deviation of $1.40. After the cookies were introduced, the purchases were as on the table below. With a total of 30 purchases. Using an alpha level of P less than 0.05, is this a significant increase in purchase amount? The coffee shop wants to know if their average sale amount goes up, but they would also want to know if their average sale amount went down. Therefore, our research hypothesis is that the new average sale amount does not equal the old average sale amount, and the null hypothesis would be that the new average sale amount does equal the old average sale amount. Simply looking at the means will tell us which direction it goes, but we need a hypothesis test to tell us whether or not that difference is significant or not. Here are our variables for this example. The independent variable is cookies for sale. The dependent variable is purchase price. Our first step is to figure out the mean needed to reject the null hypothesis. In order to do this, we are going to do a z-test. So what is a z-test? It's a test that uses z-scores to identify whether or not you can reject your hypothesis based on whether your sample mean is sufficiently different than the population mean. But that all depends on you knowing what a z-score is. So what is a z-score? It is the number of standard deviations a score is from the mean. For instance, in our example, the population mean is 4.20. That would become the center of our normal distribution and would be considered zero. Since our population standard deviation is 1.4, then a score of 5.6, which is 1.4 away from 4.2, would have a z-score of 1, and a score of 2.8 would have a z-score of negative 1. The cool thing about z-scores is that they have a normal distribution, which can be turned into percentiles. 68% of the scores that you'll have are within one standard deviation from your mean, and 96% are within two standard deviations. This is on either side. These percentiles allow us to do z-tests because we can calculate what percentile our sample mean is beyond and depending on what standards we set, whether that is enough. So how do we do that? We start by collecting some numbers. Looking at this example, we have the population mean provided as well as the standard deviation, or sigma. You can calculate your sample mean by hand, with a calculator, or with a program, whatever you prefer. On this example page, we already have the mean and standard deviation for the population. So as for calculating the sample mean, we should go ahead and write it all down in one place so we can keep track of it. The sample mean for this particular example is $5.42. The sample size n is 30. Lastly, we need to calculate the standard error. If I can get all of my formula to come in. And the standard error is going to be the standard deviation for the population divided by the square root of the sample n. 
4, as you can see down here, for this example, it's going to be 1.4 divided by the square root of 30, which is going to be 0.26. Hang on to these numbers. We're going to need them later. Next, we have to set our standards of what we're looking for. We would like to know if cookies will increase the average sale by making people add on cookies to their coffee purchases, or if they will decrease purchase amounts by making people think about their calorie consumption and downgrade their coffee to a small. Therefore, on a scale of possible prices, with the old population mean at the center, we are going to be looking for a major difference in either direction, so we will be doing what is called a two-tailed test. The research convention is to use Q less than 0.05 as a cutoff for whether or not your results are significant. Since we are going to be doing a z-test, we will use a z-score cutoff, or critical value. You can find the cutoff z-score for any p-value for either one or two-tailed tests on a z-table. However, less than 0.05 is the most common, so it's a good one to memorize. Its z-cutoff score for a two-tailed test is plus or minus 1.96. I have it written down here as CV to refer to it as a critical value. That's how you'll find it written down from here on. Now that we know what our cutoff points are, we can calculate the z-test. The formula for a z-test is the sample mean minus the population mean divided by the standard error. In our case, that would be 5.42 minus 4.20, all divided by 0 0.26. That gives us a z-score of plus 4.69, or rather positive 4.69. Let's take a look at that on a chart. Here is our normal distribution and uh, all z-scores are normally distributed because it's all based around the mean. We have uh, off in the little corners and the little tails uh, the critical value cutoffs of where the p less than 0.05 is divided between. So on the one side you have uh, two and a half percent and then on the other side you have another 2.5% that on either side of the positive or negative 1.96. So what does it all mean? Well, I wrote fail right there in the middle just as a big old reminder that if your score falls in the middle here, it's not going to be sufficiently different from your mean. So if it came only to Oh, about one standard deviation away from the middle. Yeah, it would be a little bit higher, but it wouldn't be enough higher. We're looking for significant differences. So we set the critical values at plus 1.96 if it were to go up, or negative 1.96 if it were to go down. Well, our score is a positive 4.69, which would put it way out here in outer space. It's definitely, definitely past the cutoff limit, which means that we can reject the null. We don't fail to reject the null. So we win. Well, kind of. Mostly it's just because uh, the person who put uh, this sample together just really, really likes chocolate and uh, put really high scores in and it made a really weird sample. You're probably not going to kind end up with this kind of a result if you're actually doing real research. But for samples, it's fun to dream that chocolate can get one a fortune. So, to sum up, this does mean that our z-test is passed and our hypothesis mm -hmm. appears that it may be accurate. We can certainly reject the null hypothesis. There's always a chance that it could still just be, well, chance. But uh, it's starting to look more promising. We can never completely accept our research hypothesis, but for this instance, according to the limit sweeps that we can reject our null. This allows us to move on to the next step. Calculating statistical power. So what is statistical power? 
It's the likelihood that you will correctly reject the null hypothesis given that the null hypothesis is false. So basically, given the understanding that uh, there is a major difference between your means, how likely are you going to detect that? Also, it's the probability that uh, you won't make a type 2 error. Statistical power ranges from 0 to 1, or rather 0% to 100%. Point 0.8 or 80% is a traditional baseline. A lot of statisticians use it as a basis for whether or not to continue with the study. If they have a statistical power of 0.8 or greater, that means they can go ahead and continue with their study and will correctly reject the null. Calculating statistical power is one way to determine what sample size you need when you are creating your study. Regardless of when you want it though, here's how to do it. The first thing you have to ask is, what is the mean I would have needed to reject the null? In order to calculate this, you need some of the numbers that you used before. The critical value the standard error, and then the population mean. You may notice that the critical value is a little different this time. Instead of running a two-tailed test, I'm running a one-tailed greater than test, because it's a little bit simpler to do a one-tailed test than a two-tailed when calculating statistical power. The critical value for a one-tailed greater than test is 1.64. If it were a one-tailed less than test, it would be a negative 1.64. But since we are wanting it to be greater than the other, it's going to be positive. To answer the question, what is the mean I would have needed to reject the null, you have to multiply the critical value by the standard error and then add the population mean. That will give you the mean needed in order to reject the null. For our example, that is going to be 1.64 times 0 0.26 plus 4.20. That gives us an answer of 4.63. Your next step is going to calculate a z-score of the mean needed minus the mean that you have. The mean needed was, again, 4.63, and then the mean that we had was 5.42. And you divide all of that by 0 0.26, which is the standard error. That gives us a number of negative 3.04. In case you notice the sudden change in the bottom sentence, I just realized that I had left it as negative 3.05. That's all fixed. Negative 3.04 is the difference between what you have and what you need. That takes us to the next step. You'll want a z-table for this. If you look on a z-table, you will find that 3.04 is 49.87 from the z-score of 3.04 to 0. That's just one half of the scale, though. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you add 50 for the other 50% onto it. That gives you a total percent of 99.87. Or a 99.87% chance of rejecting the null. There is only a 0.13% chance that uh, given the number that you got and the number that you would have needed, that you would fail to reject the null. So what does it all mean? Power has little to do with whether your null hypothesis is true or false. What it tells you is, if there is something to find, will you find it? There are five things that affect statistical power. One of them is your alpha level. That's going to be your p-value. If you change your p-value from p less than 0.05 to p less than, oh, say, 10, 
that means that uh, you're going to have a lot more statistical power. Unfortunately, though, that also means that you're increasing the probability of a type at one error from 5% to 10%, which is probably worse. You don't want to power at that expense. You can also move it in the other direction into p less than 0.01. It gives you less power, but you also reduce the likelihood of a type 1 error. Most scientists, however, just like to keep it at the regular p less than 0.05. Another thing that affects it is whether you use a one or a two-tailed test. Using a one-tailed test gives you greater statistical power. However, a two-tailed test is generally recommended because it's a little bit more strict and you are usually a little bit safer or better off with a little bit more conservative two-tailed test because the one-tailed test sometimes just makes it a little bit too easy. Another way to increase or decrease statistical power is changing the sample size. The more sample size that you have, the more statistical power, and vice versa. Imagine that you were testing for something that only occurred one in a hundred people, but you only had a sample size of 30. Well, yeah, it could show up, but it also might not. Increasing your sample size to 100 or, say, 300 or maybe even 1,000 would greatly increase your odds of finding something. Another option is to change the mean difference between levels of your control variables. For instance, if you're doing repeated measures, you could test over a greater length of time. You would only have one mean for that group, but the mean might change given more time. Lastly, Reducing the standard deviation is another way to increase statistical power. This one isn't very easily manipulated. Its best option for changing is in the design of the study, having very good and reliable study techniques, or by selecting your sample from a more homogeneous group, in which the responses that you receive are more likely to be the same or at least more similar. What all of this means is that just because a study doesn't show any results doesn't mean that uh, there are no results to be shown. Granted, there are plenty of uh, studies that show results that aren't real, and plenty that don't show any results when there really are no results to be shown. This is just another tool whenever you're analyzing uh, either existing research or planning your own. Alright, that's all. This video has been over hypothesis testing using z-tests and calculating statistical power. Thanks for listening.